Welcome back to Winning Law. I'm attorney David Wynn with offices in Houston, Texas. And today I'm going to share information about an American Immigration Lawyer Association meeting that I attended approximately two weeks ago on the 9th. And what the American Immigration Lawyer Association is, is a network of immigration attorneys who are concerned about immigration laws and its policies. And we join the organization so we can all stay updated with the latest immigration changes. The good thing about this agency is that they have liaisons. These are immigration attorneys that work closely with various agencies under the Department of Homeland Security. So just to recap, for those that are new to immigration, even though the U.S. Department of Homeland Security is the agency responsible for overseeing the immigration process here in the U.S., underneath this agency, there are an umbrella of other agencies or sub-agencies. One of it is called USCIS. It stands for the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. And if you're submitting certain filings with immigration, that's the agency that you use. Another agency is Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE for short, and this is the agency that's responsible for monitoring immigration for people inside of the U.S., like they're already here. And then you have another agency called the Customs and Border Patrol. Those are the people you see at the airport, and they're responsible for monitoring our borders and making sure that they're secure. And then you have EOIR, which stands for the Immigration Court, and if a foreign nationals in removal proceedings, this is where you would go to have your case heard. So what I want to do in this video is share some of the things that I learned at this meeting that I didn't know. And then I'll share some things that the organization did not mention, which means that they're not familiar with this new change with immigration. So when you're watching this video, just remember that immigration doesn't announce many of its changes. It just starts implementing changes. And then immigration attorneys will start asking questions. And then it comes into light that the agency is actually creating this new policy. The first one was regarding naturalization oath ceremonies. So before, immigration advised immigration attorneys to tell their clients that they're unable to bring friends or family with them to the oath ceremony. Now things are a little different. So it varies from city to city. So in Houston specifically, they are stating that if you have an oath ceremony at the Houston field office, the place where you went for your naturalization test, you're unable to bring in friends or family for your oath ceremony. However, if you are scheduled by chance at the M.O. Campbell Center, which is a larger arena, then you're able to bring your friends and family members. So it's essentially just the luck of the draw. So usually what I tell my clients, and this is even before I found this information, is that you can try to bring your friends and family, but there is a good chance that they're not going to be allowed inside that ceremony room. The second takeaway involves affirmative asylum cases. So if you are not in removal or deportation proceedings and your asylum matter is not before an immigration judge, you would file an affirmative asylum case with your local asylum office. So if you do this, immigration has this policy first in first out, meaning that if you apply, there's an 80% chance that usually that you will have an interview with the local asylum office within one to three months. Now this policy was enacted a couple years ago to reduce the backlog. However, there has been a new change because of the issue and the war in Ukraine. These cases are now taking priority. So if you are filing an affirmative asylum case now, instead of 80% chance that you'll receive an interview in one to three months, there is probably only a 10 to 20% chance. And this is because the Ukrainian cases are taking priority with asylum. So if you already filed your affirmative asylum case and you're waiting for the interview, or you're about to file your affirmative asylum case, just know that most likely you're not gonna be scheduled for an interview anytime soon. In fact, someone mentioned that usually it takes immigration about four to five years for an interview at the local asylum office, but now you just you should just add two additional years because of this new backlog. The third takeaway involves threats to immigration. So sometimes if you have an immigration attorney and your case is taking too long or you don't think that it's handled properly, usually the immigration attorney can go to immigration, schedule an info pass, and threaten to file suit under like a mandamus lawsuit or an APA lawsuit. However, now is not working anymore. So many attorneys have reported that immigration is now calling out attorneys. So instead of making just 
these little threats, you have to be ready to file a full-blown lawsuit before they take you seriously. So if your case is, you know, has a long delay and it should be processed by now, just know that instead of just hiring an attorney to threaten to file a lawsuit, unless you're willing to pay the attorney to actually file a lawsuit in federal court, it's not going to go anywhere. Threats are not enough. So these are the main three takeaways about USCIS. However, the organization did not talk about one thing that I noticed with immigration, and that is regarding social security cards. So in general, if a person applies for their green card, in the meantime, while they're waiting for that interview, they can go ahead and apply for temporary work authorization, otherwise known as an EAD card. And after the EAD card is issued, Immigration will notify an agency called the Social Security Administration. That way, that organization can send a Social Security card to the foreign national. Now, that Social Security card that's issued will have a message at the top, and it will say something like, only valid with DHS authorization. And what this means is that you can't just use the Social Security card to work. Instead, you have to use another document to show that you are eligible to work, such as an unexpired EAD card. Now with the new policy that I noticed is that immigration, after the green card is approved, immigration is just sending out a new social security card to the attorneys. Now the new social security card is a little different because it does not have that restriction at the top of the social security card. Instead, that social security card will look just like any social security card issued to a green card holder or US citizen, and it does not have that message only valid with DHS authorization. This means that if you have that social security card and you have your driver's license, it should be enough for you to start working somewhere and you don't have to show a secondary form of proof that you are eligible to work. Next, let's talk about the EOIR, or the Executive Office of Immigration Review, otherwise known as the Immigration Court, and three new changes that we didn't know, but we found out at this meeting. The first takeaway is called Friend of the Court. Now, this is a new pilot program, which means that it's not available in every immigration court. In Houston, we have three immigration courts alone, and only one immigration court, which is the Gessner location, has this pilot program. What this pilot program does is that volunteers go to immigration court and what their job is, is to help people that are not represented by attorneys kind of know what their options are in court. So a lot of people, they go to court and they are not represented by any immigration attorney because either they don't want an immigration attorney, they don't feel like it's gonna be helpful, or they can't afford an immigration attorney. And these volunteers are supposed to work with the government and work with the foreign national just to give them steps in the right direction. They're not going to give per se good legal advice. All they're doing is telling them like, hey, these are your options and hopefully they'll take some of those options. So again, this is a pilot program. They're starting up and if it becomes popular, it may be implemented across other immigration courts across the US. So the second takeaway involves pre-trial conferences. So this is a new thing that immigration court is doing. So usually when you're in removal or deportation proceedings, there's only two different types of hearings before the immigration court. The first one is called the master calendar hearing, and this is where you go to court and you give the immigration judge an update about what's happening with your case. And the second type of hearing is called an individual hearing. And at this hearing, this is also called a merits hearing. And this is where your trial actually takes place and a decision is made on your case. Since there are thousands of backlog cases in the immigration courts, the pretrial conference is designed to help speed it up because instead of just waiting around for a master calendar hearing, immigration attorneys or even immigration, ICE, they can encourage or request a pretrial conference. And what this will do is it acts kind of like a master calendar hearing, but that you could just request it instead of waiting for the immigration judge to issue that notice. So what we are hearing from other immigration attorneys is that the ICE or the government attorney is not taking these pretrial conferences very seriously. For example, some of the, when they go to these pretrial conferences, the opposing government attorney doesn't know anything about the case. They don't bring the case file. They don't have the case file. And some of them don't even show up. So even though this is a new program, I think that it's going to take some time before the ICE counsel or ICE attorneys take it seriously. The last change with the immigration courts is a program called the Off-Docket Initiative. And this is a new 
program that they have started doing. So what it calls for is usually when you are in removal or deportation proceedings, when you're at the individual or the merits hearing, the judge usually does one of two things. They either issue an order of termination, which means that you're no longer in deportation proceedings, or they issue an administrative closure, which means that they just temporarily close your case. Yes, the government can reopen your case and put you in removal proceedings, but they're not actively trying to do it right now. So although that you're, you're still in deportation proceedings, they're not actively pursuing your removal from the U.S. So with the off docket initiative, what it does is, is kind of like an administrative closure. It means that you're still in deportation proceedings, but the government is just not requiring you to go to, to immigration court. And there's a lot of problems with administrative closures and this off docket initiative because it still means that you're in deportation proceedings. So later on, if you qualify for other government benefits, let's say, for example, temporary protected status or TPS, maybe be, maybe you qualify for VAWA, maybe you have a family or relative that's able to sponsor you, you're still going to have to go back to court and get that case reopen before you can do certain things or get your green card in the U.S. Also, you may have issues traveling abroad if you later qualify. So if your case is placed on the off docket initiative list, it may not be a good thing. I strongly recommend that you speak with your immigration attorney to determine whether or not this is a good thing for your case or if there are alternative routes that would make your immigration case a lot better. So just because your case is placed on this initiative list, it doesn't mean you have to accept it. When the government sends out these notices, they usually list you have 30 to 60 days to accept that order or your attorney or yourself, you could file a motion for a different type of order. So those are the three main takeaways about the immigration courts. However, what I didn't hear the court liaison talk about was about prosecutorial discretion request. So when you're in removal or deportation proceedings, your immigration attorney or even you yourself can speak with an agency called OPLA which is part of ICE, and you can ask them to either do certain things for your case, like either dismiss it, you know, do a, a joint motion to terminate it, or concede to certain things that you want as forms of relief. However, I notice that they're getting a lot more difficult. They're not as easy as they once were. So if you are advised to do a PD or a prosecutorial discretion request, just know there is a good chance that it may just be denied. Now let's talk about the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, otherwise known as ICE. Now, the liaison for ICE didn't really have anything extra to share. However, I will tell you something that they didn't talk about that's happening with our cases. I noticed that ICE, usually when they want to put a foreign national in removal or deportation proceedings, they give them an NTA or a notice to appear. That way they can appear before the immigration court. This starts their removal and deportation proceedings. However, it seems like ICE is very busy right now. Maybe they're very busy with the whole Ukraine situation. Maybe they're just busy with the current backlog. Maybe they're understaffed. But whatever the reason is, it's taking them a very long time to actually place someone in deportation proceedings after issuing the NTA. Just give you a good example is that we have a client that we filed a K-1 fiance visa for this person. After we filed the case, the foreign national listened to her friends and then she entered the U.S. illegally or without inspection. After she came in through Mexico, the government caught her and ICE gave her an NTA letter telling her to appear before an immigration court. The only problem is that this happened about a year ago and to date, the government hasn't actually taken that NTA and given it to the immigration court. Now, what this means is that we're kind of in a gray area because I want to file some motions in the immigration court for her, but I can't do this until she's actually placed in deportation proceedings. And that means that ICE has to actually give that NTA to the court. So if you received an NTA and you can't find your information on the immigration court's website and it's been over a year, just know that you're not alone. There are other cases that are just like yours. Now let's talk about the Customs and Border Patrol, or the CBP. Again, these are the people that you find at the airports that are monitoring our borders, making sure that if you're here in the U.S., that you do what you're supposed to do if you're a foreign national. The first takeaway involves expedited removal proceedings. So usually, if you're in removal proceedings, you have to go before an immigration judge. 
However, if you're at the airport, they can issue something called an expedited removal order, which means they can deport you without you having to actually go to immigration court. So we are hearing from a lot of immigration attorneys that the number of expedited removals have increased substantially. So if you are a foreign traveler coming to the U.S., I strongly encourage you to speak with an immigration attorney. No matter if it's your first time or your second time coming to the U.S., there are so many changes with the CBP that it's in your best interest to speak with an attorney to determine what type of questions the CBP-8 officer may ask you and how to best respond to their questions. The second takeaway is that there is more discrimination happening with the CBP. So a lot of discrimination is targeted to certain people in certain countries. So right now with the whole Ukraine and Russia war, immigration is taking a very hard look at this. And what they're doing is that if you are from Russia or China or another country that supports Russia publicly, you may have issues coming into the country, even if you're here for a really good purpose. And I'll share a story after we go through the different points. But again, it's a very scary situation. So if you're one of these in one of these countries like Russia, China, or another country supporting the Russia war, then you're going to have issues when you're at the border and trying to come into the US. The third takeaway really bothers me because in the past, if you had an immigration attorney and you provided your client with a G28 notice of representation, if they had issues at the border, the CBP would actually call up the attorney and speak with them before ordering that client deported. However, the CBP has changed their policy. Now they don't care if you have an immigration attorney or not. If they place you in deportation proceedings or expedited removal proceedings, they'll just deport you even if you have an attorney. So this is why it's very important that before you come to the US, you speak with your immigration attorney to determine what you can do to alleviate or decrease your likelihood of being placed in deportation proceedings. And this is why just starting last week or a couple days ago, I started sending out emails to my clients that are about to come to the U.S., either as a fiance or an immigrant relative, just to help them at the CBP stage. This way they can explain to the CBP officer why they're coming to the U.S. They can show the letter that we're giving them. This way, I think it's going to decrease their chances of being placed in expedited removal proceedings. So the one thing that I didn't hear the Customs and Border Patrol liaison talk about was that immigration, they're discriminating against everyone and not just students, not just temporary visitors, it's, it's everyone. So recently, one of my clients, they came in as an immigrant relative. They were on a sibling petition, meaning that their sister filed for this individual years ago, like over a decade ago, and now they're finally able to come to the U.S. Now, this individual was very, like, a lot older, and when she came to the U.S., they placed her and a lot of other people in secondary inspection. So if you're coming to the U.S., even as an immigrant, which means that the government knows that you're here to stay permanently, there is a very good chance they're going to stick you in secondary inspection. And what that means is that instead of just being able to come to the U.S., being very quick about it, they're going to place you in a room with a bunch of other individuals, make you wait there for one or two hours before they release you. So if you're coming to the U.S., you definitely want to speak with your immigration attorney to see what you can do, what they can provide you in order to decrease your chances of having to go into secondary inspection. So before I end this video, I want to share a story that another attorney told me about one of her clients. So this attorney explained that one of her clients was here in the U.S. on a J-1 temporary visa. While she was here, she was accepted to Harvard on a full scholarship for a Ph.D. program. So what this meant is that she couldn't just stay in the U.S. She had to go out of the U.S. to get a new visa called an F-1 student visa so she could pursue her studies. Since this individual is from China, what did she do? She went to the closest consulate near her, which was in Mexico, which... You know, anyone knows that makes sense, right? If you are from China, but you really just want to go to school here, you would go to Mexico, which is very close to get your visa. That way you can quickly come back to the U.S. to pursue your studies. So she was able to go to the consulate in Mexico and she received her F1 student visa to allow her to study in the U.S. When she came to the U.S., she was stopped by the CBP officer. The CBP officer asked her a lot of questions about her home country of China, and then they asked her what her major was. I think her major was applied sciences. 
And then the government asked, or the CPP officer asked, why are you studying applied sciences? And then she said something like, it was, it, she just found it interesting. And then they told her that, I think you're going to actually use this degree to, to take the information back to China and use it against the US government. And what did they do? They placed her in holding for about 12 to 14 days. And then they issued her an expedited removal order, deporting her from the US and canceled her visa. So what is this telling you? When you're watching this video, just know that immigration is being very unfair right now. We thought that with Biden in office, immigration laws would be a little different and a lot better. But as you can see here, the immigration officers, they have a lot of discretion in deciding whether or not a person can come to the U.S. So if you are about to come to the U.S., no matter how well you think your case is documented, speak with an immigration attorney to determine whether or not there are things you can do to decrease your chances of being placed in holding and having your visa revoked and being expedited, expedited removed from the U.S. So after watching this video, I hope you can understand why it's so important that you have a good and experienced immigration attorney to help you with your immigration process. No matter how strong your case looks like on the outside, you may still be placed in expedited removal by the CBP or have your case rejected by the immigration court or USCIS. Again, thank you for watching Winnie Law. I'm attorney David Wynn, and we hope that we have made immigration easier to understand. At David Wynn's Law Office, we are here to help you. We bring families together through immigration. And on the other hand, we help you find solutions. All your legal needs in the hands of people who care, who are there for you. We'll take care of your loved ones at the law office of David Wren.